This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. This topic, Beckett and Music, it's quite big. Um, and I'm kind of delighted to say it's increasingly explored, really. Um, the first landmark, I would say, was, um, came thanks to Mary Bryden, who put together a book back in 1992, I'm pretty certain it was 1992, called Samuel Beckett and Music. Hello, come on in, <laughs> it's all right. Um, and really, Mary, that, that was a, the real start of something. I think before then, there were um, a few of us around the place who were very interested in Beckett and music, who had explored different aspects of that, the relationship between those two things. Um, there were a few published articles, some really, really interesting ones, um, but not so much of a kind of field of exploration. But Mary pulled that book together um, uh, and since then, there's been a kind of growing interest in this field, I would say. Um, in part, of course, it stems from the fact that Beckett himself loved music. He was a player of the piano. He listened to lots of music. It was there in his family life when he was growing up. Um, and it continued to be an important part of his life in Paris. So he had, as you probably know, his wife was a pianist, um, but also... He was great friends with composers and other musicians, so Marcel Mialovici in particular, the composer, and his wife, Monique Haas, who was a concert pianist. He spent a lot of time with them, um, socialising and listening to music with them, expanding his range of what he knew. And likewise, with um, the painter Avido Arica and his wife, they spent a lot of time, he writes about, um, to them about music. Um, Beckett was quite opinionated about music, as most things. It comes out in his letters. You've probably seen those little comments that he tends to make. Um, so at one point he says the Beethoven quartets are a waste of time. He talks about um, Furtwängler, the conductor, as uh, murderous. He talks about Furtwängler's trio as, a, as producing a frenzy of impotence. There's all sorts of lovely little phrases, throwaway phrases, very dismissive quite often. Um, of some musical performers, and then rapturous about others. And those little comments about music pervade his letters. But also his notes on his reading in philosophy and other areas. Um, every so often you come across things there which also encounter questions about music, about what it means, and show him to be thinking about um, what music is, what it does, and using it as a kind of touchstone for writing, I suppose. So overall, I would say there's, there's you know, three main areas in this overall topic. The first one is the use of music that Beckett, um, the, the uses that Beckett puts music to. So we might mean that literally. There is music in some of his plays. There are snippets of music, of course, sung now and again by characters, but there are also quite significant roles for pre for extant musical works. In Ghost Trio, of course, when he uses Beethoven's Ghost Trio. In Nacht und Träume, when he uses the Schubert song. In All That Fall, again, we have Death in the Maiden. And then, of course, in Words and Music and Cascando, there are roles that need to be composed by, by somebody who's going to write some music. So it's quite significant roles for music in the work. But then there are also more... Little, little throwaway references throughout a lot of his writing. Um, in some of the early, in Dream Affair to Middling Women and some of the early stories, you get little snippets of notation sometimes. Um, and in the Addenda to What, for example, as well. Little quotations, little references to composers. So that it's kind of nags away. So there's that literal role for music in Beckett's work, actual music or references to music. But there's also a conceptual role that's there very explicitly some of the time and then in the background um, at other times. So there's plenty of evidence in his writing of him thinking about music, about what it is, about what it might mean, and sometimes using some quite obscure sources in order to do so. So um, one of the most obvious examples is Schopenhauer, who he references in his book on Proust, but then also calls up in the ways that he writes about Beethoven later on in Dream of Fair to Middling Women, calls up Schopenhauer-like ideas, and he echoes phrases from Schopenhauer that are all about drawing on um, Schopenhauer's idea of what music is and how it is the highest art form, supposedly. And then we see Beckett using that to help him think about what, what it's how it is different to literature, 
what form literature might take if it modelled itself in some way on music, particularly Beethoven in the early days. There's also quite obscure references to tuning and tonality, to Pythagoras, but also to Louis Laloy, who was a, a, um, a musicologist who focused on Chinese music and took a particular kind of Pythagorean look at Chinese music and wrote about tuning systems, and that, that invades Beckett's thinking as well. He's using it to think about rationality and coherence and whether he wants things to be fragmented or how he pulls things into neat and coherent structures, and that's there in that early work as well. And it comes back again in Murphy and even later on in, in Watt. So there's the idea that music or musical theories of music might in some way help him to think through what he's trying to do as a writer, to help him to um, explore ideas of fragmentation, coherence, accommodating the chaos, ways to accommodate the chaos, of course. So that's the first area, I would say, the first big area is how Beckett uses music in his own work, whether actual music or ideas about music. The second big area, of which there's loads to say, is, of course, the, the musicality of his own work, um, by which people mean many different things. So there are now plenty of articles and attempts to look at Beckett's forms and structures in terms of musical structures, some more than successful than others, in my view. There's ways of looking at some of Beckett's directorial practices and the ways he worked with actors and actresses, of course, in terms of musical instruments and his conducting practices, all of those kinds of things. Then there's the nature of the, the material, the treatment of material, the attention to sounding qualities of language and to structures and patterns of language and the, the importance that he um, puts on those things and the musicality of the, the verbal flow of words. And then there's listening, the importance of listening in his work, which is there throughout, I would say, in all sorts of ways, that there's an attentiveness to all kinds of sounds, not just to musical sound, to tiny sounds, to insect sounds, when characters are kind of buried in the mud, to what's around them, and to the importance of listening as a way of trying to make sense of the world or a way of testing out our existence, I suppose. And listening couples, of course, are really, really important in Beckett. One, listener, one, one figure listening to another read, as in Ohio Impromptu or... Uh, yeah. So the musicality of the work, I would say, is the second big area. And then the third is composers' uses of Beckett, the ways in which they've responded to his work. And there are so many examples of that now. There are literally hundreds of examples of um, compositional responses to Beckett. And I use the phrase responses too because it's so, so broad the ways in which composers have used Beckett. Of course many have set his texts to music um, but an awful lot have not. An awful lot have taken an aspect of Beckett's work and produced a kind of musical version of it. A, a form of translation is a word I sometimes use for some approaches or taken an aspect of his world and tried to produce a musical counterpart to that. And that's something that interests me almost more than the setting of his words. For me, Beckett's words are so, uh, so carefully composed in themselves that setting them to music is almost always problematic, in my view. But there are, exam there are um, examples, you know, and of course that is purely my view. But what, So what I get really interested in is what's happening when composers are saying, actually, I don't necessarily want to set the words but there's things in this world or things in this way of thinking about the world, patterning, treatment of characters that actually I want to, I think are particularly musical and I'm going to take those and play about with those. So that's the third area. So we have uses of music, the musicality of the work and then compositional or musical responses to the work. Of course there's lots of interrelationships between those three things as well. And I think it's also important to say that certainly in, I feel that, Beck, that music for Beckett is what it is changes. There's certain things that carry on through his life, but he's very interested in lots of different aspects of music. And I think that is part of his musicianship, that he understands that music, different kinds of music are different things, that philosophers, and particularly Schopenhauer, have tended to talk about an abstract idea of music, this thing that is there in the world. But, and sometimes that's useful to Beckett. But also, I think he recognises that music operates differently. Different kinds of music operate very differently. They mean, it means different things to us. 
how it sounds has a different affective reality for us. It connects to different kinds of cultural ideas at different times. And sometimes I think he's drawing very much on that, particularly, for example, when he uses Schubert, that invocation of a particular kind of German romanticism and the kinds of memories and associations that that brings up. That's very particular, and it's quite different to what he does with Beethoven, for example. So, today, Derville has asked me to focus primarily in the third area, and particularly to think about the relationship between Beckett and contemporary music theatre of the last 50 years or so. So, some work that was contemporaneous with Beckett, that was either responding to his work or exploring similar concerns. And then a little bit of recent work that, again, is Beckett-like in some way. Um, so uh, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I've got a written paper. I'm going to show you some examples. It's always a little bit tricky, or I find it a little bit tricky, not exactly knowing who I'm talking to. I know some of you. Um, and I'm bringing these two areas together, of course, Beckett and contemporary music theatre. I tend to assume that the people at this kind of in this kind of environment are more likely to know the Beckett than they are to know the other side. Um, so I'm going to talk much more about the other pieces, the musical pieces, and make, try and make the links back to Beckett rather than talking very much about Beckett. I hope that's okay. If that means that we end up with kind of, you feel there's gaps along the way, then maybe we can talk about those in the questions. Um, and if you are the other way around and you're a kind of music theatre, contemporary music theatre specialist, then I apologise because I'll be saying a few introductory kind of fairly basic things, and then hopefully a few more interesting things along the way. This is actually, a, um, Derville said she'd be quite happy for me to, I'm actually expanding on a talk uh, paper I gave at the Reading Station Beckett uh, conference in April. Um, and actually, this is an area of work that I didn't really take on, I deliberately didn't really take on in the book that I wrote, so it's quite nice to be able, it's one I've, talk, I've kind of taught about quite a lot. Uh, York and other places, um, one that's been in the back of my mind for a long time, so it's quite nice to be able to open this up. So anyway, here we go. Try and keep an eye on the time. In 1928, the composer Arnold Schoenberg wrote, For a long time now, I have been thinking of a form which I believed was in fact the only possible way a musician could express himself on a th theatrical stage. I called it, in talking to myself, composing with the means of the stage. Certainly throughout the 20th century and beyond, there's been a continuing, developing interest from composers in thinking of the theatre and all its elements as musical material. David Rosner puts it succinctly, commenting that composers from Schoenberg, John Cage and Mauricio Cargill, through to more recently Heiner Goebbels and Georges Apergis, to name only a few, quote, treat voice, gesture, movement, light, sound, image, design, and other features of theatrical production according to musical principles and compositional techniques, and apply musical thinking to performance as a whole. This perspective is that of the musician or musicologist. The protagonists are primarily composers who wish to explore and exploit the innate the theatricality of musical performance, of sound-making, affective bodies moving on stage. And in doing so, to think of the non-musical tools of theatre, lighting, costume, design, the configuration of space, video and other multimedia elements, simply as additional instruments, no more or less important than the sound-producing instruments and voices. As the influ influential Ar Argentinian composer Mauricio Cargill noted, quote, one can compose with sounding and non-sounding materials, actors, cups, tables, omnibuses and oboes. Not a particularly new idea now, of course. David Rosner and Matthias Rebstock call music theatre of this kind composed theatre. They define it genetically as applying fundamentally musical compositional strategies and processes to all aspects of the work's creation. And they situate this genre between more conventional music, theatre and dance, arguing that while a close relationship to other forms of interdisciplinary performance may be apparent, there are convincing reasons for considering composed theatre as a specific field of practice. Certainly, composed theatre often appears, a li appears little different to what in the UK in particular is often more commonly referred to simply as music theatre or experimental music theatre. But Rosner, Rebstock and others argue that music theatre and indeed other forms of mu musicalised theatre, which would include opera, musicals, 
instrumental theatre, sound theatre and so on, don't necessarily apply fundamentally musical thinking to the work as a whole. In these other forms, the various elements are not necessarily composed or devised in full relation to one another, or with potentially equal status. So the most ex obvious example is the use of text, where in opera and musicals, but often also in experimental music theatre, that the text is produced separately, perhaps in some kind of libretto form. Of course, the precedence of these kinds of overall conception might be seen in Dada's random collaging of, or juxtaposition of various art forms in a single performance, or alternatively in the more organised relationships in the Bauhaus theatre of totality, and certainly in Arto's determination to free theatre from the tyranny of literature. Fluxus is another antecedent. More recent composed theatre, however, treats the process of creation and the artistic materials rather differently. Eleni Veropoulou cites as particularly significant Peter Brook's use of multiple languages or a range of different accents in the speaking of the same language on stage, so an exploration of verbal interaction that's highly unlikely to be understandable, more than extremely partially, to the audience, and which instead draws on an effective response to the interrelationship of sounding patterns of language, physical interaction and scenography. Veropoulou also cites Meredith Monk's account of reaching musical composition after a journey from dance-making via theatre. Monk describes this process of, of finding the core of where she felt her performance-making to lie in what Hans T. Lehmann calls a form of staged auditory semiotics, fundamentally musical. We might see in these kinds of music theatre, or composed theatre, a kind of composely megalomania, a desire to keep control of every aspect of a Gesamtkunstwerk. And it's certainly the case that many composers in this field are also involved in the production of their works as directors, or in some cases performers too. However, as I'll discuss later, this can go the other way, in terms of the relationship to performers at least. Such approaches can be more collaborative in the process of developing materials, at least compared to, to, the, to the traditional division between composers and performers in classical music. And this is a very different kind of Gesamtkunstwerk to Wagner's due to the depth of composi compositional thinking applied equally to all elements. The approach of someone like Heiner Goebbels is indicative. He says, in an ideal process, I try to compose like a director who is able to discover and develop and not to oppress the qualities and the options which come up with the individual performers he works with. I never start with a complete musical score or vision. On the other side, I direct like a composer. I work very formally and consider theatre very much a musical process. I formally believe in the space of an aesthetic experience and rather think about the rhythm of scenes, the harmonic or contrapuntal relationship of the theatrical elements and the different levels between a visual and an acoustic stage." Unquote. We might note a close relationship between forms of music theatre, composed theatre or instrumental theatre and contemporaneous developments in other theatre practices, including those with little or no explicit musical component, particularly forms of practice theorised as post-dramatic. Theatre and indeed live art that has sought to problematise theatrical representation, to explore and exploit non-narrative structures of time and experience, and to use language for more than narrative and character functions, often has a resultant musical effect stemming from a focus on the sounding qualities of language rather than its semantic functions. Veropoulou calls this a musicalisation of all theatrical means, and Lehman identifies this as one characteristic of post-traumaticism. Certainly, the problematising of representation, communication and the subject triggers the, the need to fail that is explored in much contemporary performance, and of course this invokes Beckett. As Sarah Jane Bales arg argues, Beckett is a key figure for performance groups such as Forced Entertainment and Goat Island, who operate in this way. But equally, musicality in theatre is often a counterpart to the exploration of failure with its turn towards forms of affective significance that avoid singularity of meaning, characterisation and narrative, and instead use repetitive structures of action and words that question their own communicative status. In this sense, though, as Rosner notes, the musical effect in post-traumatic theatre is less the result of truly compositional thinking than a resultant performative quality contingent upon the desemanticization of language. 
Ultimately, all this name, this genre, this naming things, dis distinguishing between composed theatre, music theatre, performance art, experimental theatre, post-dramatic theatre, and so on, it's of course not very interesting to any of us, except for the extent to which it re reveals common tendencies or shared approaches, exposing trends and influences. In my context today, the point is to use this frame as a backdrop for considering the relationship between certain forms of recent music theatre and certain key characteristics of Beckett's work. There are two strands to this, parallels and influences. Parallel developments in music theatre that were contemporaneous with Beckett, in which we might identify characteristics also found in his work, and then more recent music theatre that in some sense draws on Beckett, his influence providing the stimulus for new creative approaches. To date, mm, thank you. <laughs> to date, little consideration has been given to the relationship between Beckett and music theatre from the 1960s onwards, but there are significant connections. In particular, the language of Beckett's later plays often seems comparable to the treatment of voice found in the works of certain composers from the 1950s onwards, mid-1950s onwards. At this time, many Western composers felt that traditional classical methods of word setting, particularly in an opera, had become redundant. Alongside this ran a developing interest in the musical potential of non-singing vocal sounds, leading to a number of works and a body of work that's still expanding today, predicated upon the theatre of extended vocal techniques, with speech, humming, whispering, screams, laughter, cries, and other vocal sounds included alongside sung tones. Many composers of this period questioned the idea that setting words to music should have provided an additional layer of meaning, a counterpointing of the text that would support the dramatic or poetic ideas and colour them. Too often, this resulted in the music becoming either subservient to narrative or poetic concerns, or conversely too prominent, obscuring, obscuring the poetic complexity of the text. So instead, composers like Luciano Berio, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, Georgi Ligeti, amongst many others, became interested in a more purely musical theatre, making use of the full range of sounds that the voice can produce, exploring the innate theatre of those vocal articulations and paying increasing attention to the musical aspects of language. Luciano Berio's work is particularly interesting in this respect, and the key compositions are contemporaneous with Beckett's stage work in the decade from play, for some time, in the late 1950s, Berio worked in the Studio di Fonologia, sorry, in, sorry, <laughs> in Milan, with other composers, but also with linguists and semioticians, and especially Umberto Eco. Some of Berio's work was con concerned with the sonorous relationship between elements of European languages, and this seeps into his compositions and into its exploration of the boundaries of sound and sense. His Sequenza Three from 1966 and O King from 1967, for example, dissect the phonetic and semantic elements of simple texts, fragmenting the words, breaking up the semantic cohesion, and playing with the different articulatory, sounding, and meaningful possibilities of the components. In a note to Sequenza Three, Berio commented on his interest in the performing voice. Quote, the voice always carries an excess of connotations, whatever it's doing. From the grossest of noises to the most delicate of singing, the voice always means something, always refers beyond itself and creates a huge range of associations, unquote. The effect here is sometimes purely musical, with sung tones or even short phrases appearing momentarily, and sometimes more purely semantic, with odd words or syllables suddenly spoken clearly. Primarily, though, these works play with the relationships and limits of music and language, exploring fields of semiotic ambiguity and their effective impact. So this is related to, but qualitatively different from, the broader musicalisation of language identified by Lehman, Varopoulou and others as the desemanticization of language in aspects of post-traumatic and devised theatre. There's a shared interest in the semiotics of vocal sound but Berio composes, of the, composes the music of the voice very precisely with the details fully notated. So the, the score, the first part of the score, I don't know how clearly you can see that, but it doesn't really matter whether you can read music or not. I think the important thing is that you've probably all seen a classical, a, a more conventional classical score would know that it normally has five lines, uh, clefs, and that this is very much more varied 
that we don't have standard rhythms and pitches. Um, instead, we and we have lots and lots of little instructions. I don't know how much you can read. I've got a little. Actually, let's let's. That's a little. Uh, that's an example. So sometimes he's pulling out phonemes. He's pulling out parts of words. He's giving indications of um, articulatory delivery. He's giving. Uh, he's using note heads where there's a key at the beginning of the score. So open note heads mean one kind of sound. Across might be a, a tongue click. There's lots of little articulatory details in the notation. And pitch-wise, it's occasionally specific pitches as at the top, but more often a sense of where in the voice it should be and the shapes that the voice should be making. So um, I thought I'd show you a little extract of this. Um, I've chosen this performance that's on YouTube, partly also because you get... I'm not sure I like this as a performance overall, but it's quite useful because you, you see little bits of um, the score come up in the film as she plays it. So let's see if, we can, if this works for us, hopefully. There's a couple of minutes of it. Do we need the lights off? I think we're going to be all right, aren't we? show the whole thing for time reasons I've got quite a few things I want to show so I'm just going to leave her sorry about that Laura Katrani um, but it's easy enough to find if you want to see it anytime so there's many differences between what Barrio was doing what Beckett was interested in um, in many respects the body of com compositions by Barrio and other composers of the time who were exploring the theatre of the voice and the relationships between words and music there's lots of differences in terms of thematic content, compositional structure, and aesthetic concerns. But Beckett's use of fragmented and dispersed narrative, of fast vocal delivery that impedes immediate comprehension, and of a repetitive and elusive, allusive patterning of language that ex exploits its musical qualities, shares with the work of Berio and others an understanding of the dramatic tensions of vocal utterance. And compared to many contemporary theatre practitioners, practitioners Beckett's textual composition in works like Play, Not I, Rockabye, Footfalls, and others is more precisely composed. He may not have used forms of scoring such as Berio's, though we might, of course, remember his desire to question Stravinsky about possible forms of rhythmic notation for his plays. But through the careful patterning of repetition and difference, the audience is, as with Berio, drawn into the sensual as well as the structural drama of the gradually evolving phonetic, musical, and semantic relationships. I think particularly with something like Not I, when you listen to, well, when you, you look at the ways in which 
patterns of phrases come back time and time again with certain syllables stressed in, um, at the end of uh, similar stress patterns in the language. And you, you, work, you understand, especially when you hear someone like Billy Whitelaw, of course, but also more recently Lisa Dwan perform, the ways in which those start to come in, out in performance. So if you, I've spent some time in my sad way analysing some of the pitch structures of what they're doing and you start to find the ways in which they tend to dwell on the certain syllabic patterns that are coming back and time and time again and they're coming in the same range of the voice. So we start to make these associations between these patterns of sound. So even though we're flooded with language, we, there's something in the musical delivery and the patterning and the structuring that Beckett has put in there, we're ending up with things which, rather like Dario, are insisting on certain kinds of patterns of repetition we, that, that give it some kind of coherence, even when we don't know what really quite is going on, or we're not quite grasping all the detail. Unlike many music theatre composers, especially more recently, Berio provides no spatial or physical dramaturgy for Sequenza 3. So the score gives no detailed vocal instruction, sorry, it, give, it gives detailed vocal instructions and, as you saw, descriptions of the emotional states to be evoked, but nothing more. Nevertheless, the final lines of his commentary that he put in, um, into the score of Sequenza 3 might equally apply to some of the somewhat self-referential theatre of the voice in Not I. So this is Berio. He says, in Sequenza 3, the emphasis is given to the sound symbolism of vocal and sometimes visual gestures, with their accompanying shadows of meaning and the associations and conflicts suggested by them. For this reason, Sequenza 3 can also be considered as a dramatic essay whose story, so to speak, is the relationship between the soloist and her own voice. So, that, um, unquote, that's the end of Berio. The quality of our experiencing the attempt to tell, of the attempt to tell, is of course something we recognise as one of Beckett's recurrent preoccupations. So I've used Berio and especially Sequenza 3 because it's very influential in this context. But equally relevant, I would say, uh, um, some more recent compositions, or slightly more recent anyway, by the Paris-based Greek composer Georges Apegis, who also works with extended vocal techniques, but in a more defined theatrical context. Um, that was especially the case in the 20 years from 1976, when his collaborative L'Atelier Théâtre Musique, which is, was known as Artem, was in operation in Paris. So Apogees often builds vocal and, vocal and musical phrases from tiny cells of one, two, or three sounds. And they might be musical notes, or they might be phonemes, or they might be completely other kinds of sounds, found sounds of any kind, but patterned, and developed through multiple repetitions in which one or two new elements are added each time to the beginning or end of the phrase. The accumulative processes of structural patterning of both music and text are somewhat similar to those employed by Beckett in his late texts. What is the word is a good example here. But the musical content of Apagis's work is, of course, explicit. In many of his recitations for solo voice, which come from 1978, he affects an obsessive revolving of key ideas that slowly build, as if gradually extracting something of artistic substance through a process that is simultaneously comical and exhausting, especially for the performer. Like Berio, Apagis is concerned with the innate theatre of the voice, divorced from explanatory narrative context. He comments on having seen his task as finding truly, quote, musical characters. That means there is a rhythmical accent, an intensity of particular colours. So there are characters that exist of nothing but a special intensity, and that becomes theatre, but it comes from music, unquote. What Apagis exploits in this respect is the ability of music to carry subjectivity without character. And this is common to all the work I'm discussing today, I'd say, and something that's also strongly apparent in Beckett. So this is an example of a, an Apagis score. <laughs> um, again, it's more important that you see the shape than, than anything else, really, um, because, as you can see, it's, it's expanding outwards. It's the adding, adding bits to either side. So like Berio, Apagis's scores map out the detail of the musical articulation, and the notations are often visually very, um, very striking. Not all of his scores are kind of visually shaped like this, but a lot of these recitations especially are. Um, but unlike Berio, for Apagis, the process of composition applies to all aspects of the work. His published notations don't always include aspects of staging, 
He develops the work primarily in rehearsal, and often only part of what results is written into the score. But when he and his team perform, they always perform, they all certainly are staged. Apergis notes the importance of the collaborative relationship with specific performers. He says, the body of an actor or musician and the way he behaves, his interest, his life, his past and all that, this is very important to me. These things inform the development of the performance. So let's have a, this, this is, well, the most performances of this are quite short, a couple of minutes. This one's two minutes 50, I think, so hopefully we can hear it. Um, if that's a, these are a couple of other examples of uh, scores from the same composer from the same set. Sometimes, so sometimes as there, he's using actual language, kind of cut up and played about with. Sometimes he uses fake bits of language, kind of phonemes which don't really form part of a standard language. Other times he uses purely musical sounds. It varies a lot. Um, sometimes also he creates structures which are drawn from... Um, some standard language, but where he's pulled out bits of the phonemes and initially uses them purely as sounds. I've got to be careful about time, but I thought I'd very briefly, there's a film that uh, a percussionist who I work with quite a lot has recently made um, a, of a piece called Cora Core, which starts, it's about 12 minutes long, I think, this performance, but um, I'll just play you a little example of the beginning. So it starts off, oh, it's not central, is it? Why is that? Oh, no, maybe it's because I haven't gone into full screen yet. Maybe that's all. It um, starts off entirely without language and seems to be entirely kind of s drum patterns. Um, if any of you know Indian drumming patterns or talking drum patterns, you know, quite often they use vowel sounds associated with meaning on in the drums. It's a little bit like that, except a made-up, slightly strange version of that. And then gradually we start to realise that it is connected to language. So, Play a tiny bit of the opening and a bit further on when we start to get a bit of language. Let's see if it does go into... Mm -hmm. 
So it starts off with this combination of these strange vocal patterns, some of which seem to be related to the drum pattern, some not, um, and other kind of ritualistic sounding vocal sounds. And then gradually we start to learn, well, we start to gain a different kind of idea about what's going on. <laughs> I'm going to pause it because gradually what happens is we start to gra gradually discover that what he's, going, what he's describing is a head-to-head -head match and a lot of the noises are actually uh, car races and um, uh, two competitors coming, up to, coming together and fighting. Gradually it becomes this spiel, more and more of language instead of sounds and gradually you start to realise all these, all these kind of sounds earlier on, these patterns of sounds were actually extrapolated from extremely fast telling of a story. So it, start, it starts in this very strange, slightly surreal fashion and gradually becomes more and more of a story that's told. Um, and it's a brilliant performance, but it's too long to show now and it's slightly off topic. So anyway, let's keep going. So, as with many, where we are, where are we? We're there, that'll do, yes. As with many other composers of music theatre, Apergis expresses a desire to avoid a hierarchy of elements. But he articulates this in terms of difference rather than singularity. Quote, the visual elements should not be allowed to reinforce or emphasise the music, and the music should not be allowed to underline the narrative. Things must complement each other, they must have different natures. Another thing has to emerge that's neither one nor the other, it's something new. So he connects that to an aesthetic of differentiation and dispersal rather than a unifying vision. Um, for him, opera is exactly what he doesn't want to do, because for him, that's a prime example of a world where you've got different artistic elements all supporting one single idea. With the lib you know, it starts with a the libretto, then the composer's vision, and then everything else is built around that. And that's not what he wants. He says, I don't believe in a world where harmony and coherence of thought rule the day. I believe more in small fragments, pieces of life that randomly come into contact. So we might say there's a commonality with Beckett's determination that the elements of his theatre should operate separately but equally, movement counterpointing voice, counterpointing lighting and so on, with lighting and design as significant as text. David Rosner suggests that this is at the root of what is often called, referred to as Beckett's musicality, related to the stripping down and absence of character. Quote, musicality in theatre for Beckett is not about mixing or synthesising art forms or media, 
but is a route towards reorienting, reorienting theatre to its essential components. It's not about adding a layer, but using a musical disposition to strip away as much as possible. I'm not convinced that's always true, but I think there's a lot in that. The relationship between Beckett and recent music theatre does not then lie solely in the musical semiotics of vocal performance. In fact, we might see a relation in examples of entirely non-verbal music theatre. There's certainly similarities between Argentinian composer Mauricio Cargill's walking scene, which is called Pada Sank. That's a, this is a little example from this. And, and Beckett's rather later quad. So both focus upon coordinated rhythmic movement around a geometric figure, neither including voices. Quad, of course, I'm tending to assume you know about, a little bit about quad. It extends the idea of patterned walking that's evident elsewhere in Beckett, with a rhythmic patterning of bodies in the stage space, the presence of each of the four figures accompanied by a distinct percussion sound. So quite a long time before this, in 1965, Cargill composed Padasank, in which five performers walk along lanes constructed to form a regular pentagon. Like Quad, the performers here walk to a pulse, but there's an explicit musical sophistication to Padasank that Quad doesn't want or need. Cargill gives each walker a different speed, and often also they've got a walking stick, so they've got two ways of producing rhythms with their feet and with a stick sometimes. And their precise rhythms are notated musically. So this is a bit of the first page of the score. You've got roots and a map, and then you've got um, rhythmic parts on the next page. That's the roots and the map, and then five performers, each with different, sometimes really quite complex rhythms um, to articulate through their walking. So it's a more complex or overtly complex musical surface. But at the same time, it's also padasank, which has more obviously dramatic elements in a traditional sense than quad. So first of all, the set is more complex. So although he draws this pentagon very simply, simply rather like the quad shape, um, in fact, you're supposed to vary the surface by using incorporating platforms, slopes or ramps and different kinds of flooring materials that will produce different sounds. Secondly, the performers can be costumed. And in addition to carrying walking sticks, they can use other props. Um, but he just makes suggestions, he doesn't tell you what. So they can, he suggests dark glasses, lamps, chairs, books, mirrors, cigars, cards and so on. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, Cargill states that, quote, Dramat dramaturgical relationships are to be created between the performers. Above all, above all, care must be taken that the five participants do not behave me merely like sleepwalkers or dolls without taking any notice of each other. It's very different to quad, I suppose, where they do. Uh, they have to take notice of other, other as or do they or not at the middle? I don't know. Here it says, glances, sudden turns, bent carriage, unfair use of the walking stick, gallant gestures, entanglement of legs with hands and stick, etc., should give the impression that in this walking scene, a number of actions are being represented simultaneously. So, um, there's so many different possible ways to realise this piece. This is a tiny little, and again, I'll just give you a snippet. This is one from um, the Pompidou Centre for Ensemble Intercontemporain. Um, that's their quad, that's their, I was going to say their quad, that's their <laughs> pentagon, which as you can see has lots of different surfaces. Um, and then I'll just give you some idea. So they come in, it's in a very echoey space indeed, Ooh. with a microphone keeps popping. Sorry, I paused it without realising. Or have we just lost the... Mm -hmm. Oh, there we are. 
Okay, so you get the idea. <laughs> so, so very different. In the, on paper, the layout of the, the um, pentagons, de very definite, different, definitely reminiscent of quad. Or sorry, I would say reminiscent of quad. It's the other way around. This came a lot earlier. But a very different effect, of course. Um, I'm also reminded, um, Derval has written, of course, about Bruce Nauman's um, slow angle walk, which again, you know, where he takes um, Watt's way of moving around, um, trying to move east by, oh, you know, he throws one bit of his body in one direction and the head in the other. And um, Bruce Nauman kind of tries to recreate this in a certain kind of way. I think um, I had the, so we have. That's the, you know, which he also called his Beckett walk, and where again the diagrams look for that look very um, similar to both Padasank and to Quad. And of course, there's lots of other examples of um, performance pieces based on patterns of walking. Lots in dance, of course. Um, I came across a really nice um, reference that intrigued me to um, a visual research ensemble that was made up a load of a load of musicians in the 70s, people who were associated with the Scratch Orchestra. Um, in the 1970s in England, um, which was a lot of musicians, particularly led by Cornelius Cardew, who really wanted to explore. They did a lot of quite theatrical things, but they particularly wanted to be very democratic and to, to produce m musical performances that didn't require um, complex instrumental skills. And Michael Parsons, who was involved in that, um, in a footnote to an article that he wrote about the relationship between scratch, scratch orchestra and art schools, um, he referred to a visual research ensemble, which I think was at Portsmouth College of Art in the early 1970s, into a Beckett-inspired performance event where the musicians uh, performed mainly silent pieces, including a looking piece derived from a passage in Beckett's novel Watt, in which the attempt of a committee to look at itself is frustrated. So as each member of the group tried to exchange, exchange looks with another, the one that, is, that one is looking at someone else, so no look is reciprocated. To return to the present day, though, it's notable how many younger composers of music with theatrical elements cite Beckett as an influence, as much in terms of his treatment of the components of theatre as the approach to the voice. Irish composer Jennifer Walsh, for example, describes Beckett as more part of her artistic heritage than, imp than important composers like Mozart or Beethoven, particularly due to his treatment of action on stage. It is, then, not just the musicality of the voice, but the detailed counterpointing of voice with staging, lighting, movement, visual imagery that is significant, and the careful composition of each element in relation to the other. The last thing I want to show you, because I know I need to finish in a minute. Um, that's the idea, isn't it? We'll finish around seven and then, yeah. The last thing I want to talk, talk, show you is something much more recent, um, from a composer called Edward Jesson, who's um, American but based in London, um, uh, who's who is someone whose work I think is absolutely deeply influenced by Beckett, but he never sets his work, never sets his words, and never produces work which is explicitly in response to Beckett's work at all. Um, but there are many different ways in which I think Ed Jesson's work derives from aspects of um, Beckett's. The best example, the easiest example of this, is a piece called Companion from 2008, which has two forms. In performance, it's, well, it's always for two performers, both of whom use their voices but also play toy pianos. When, they're, when it's played live, you have one performer on each side of the stage, um, kneeling at their pianos um, and vocalising, kneeling at their little toy pianos. Um, and the light swings from one player to another. They take turns and there's pauses between and gradually it gets closer and closer until at the very end they come together. There's also parts for a violinist and a cellist but who are off stage. Um, and play quiet, light, and disjunct, repetitious phrases. Ed made a film version, which is not a film of the performance. He kind of chose to translate it into more film-like um, ways of working. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that. This is a project I was involved in um, uh, as a, one of the performers, um, because I'm a pianist, but I also do quite a lot of music theatre things. Um, and then I'll briefly say a few things about what I see is the Beckett connections, and what Ed does maybe, and then maybe you, you might have something to say about that or not, I don't know. Anyway, again, we have, I'll play for it about the um, first couple of minutes and then jump it onwards.
channels isn't working. They should be equal volume, but one of the channels doesn't seem to be working. Pause it there, the, the, and then play the end in a minute. Um, they should be the same volume. I'm not quite sure what's happened there. It's a stereo track, and I suspect what's happened is it's the first time we've had a stereo track and that one of the channels isn't working. But my voice should be as loud as the other one, a stage whispery. So you get this scenario without explanation. Um, the sung phrases are clearly from a personal ad. Would like to meet, companion, good sense of humour, 50, 60. Whereas the stage whispered fragments seem to imply a commentary on the process of trying to put oneself into words. So we have forever trying to put together a suitable set of words. And then there's also um, some kind of fleeting gossipy comments on a meeting that seems to have taken place, perhaps with a man as a result of this advert. In this cut-up structure of brief, fast-moving snippets, half-articulated through whispers and sudden vocalisations. So the two voices... In some respects, that seems a little bit Beckett-like to me. They're alike and not the same, but so it's almost like it's some kind of split subject, maybe, rather like Beckett's pseudo-couples, the parents of speakers and listeners in Ohio Impromptu, Rockabye, AJO, Crap, Not I, or the dreamer and dreamt self in Nacht und Träumer, perhaps. Also, a bit like with Not I and Play, you have in Companion, you have a scenario, which in this case is the lo lonely heart kind of scenario, which is all too familiar, a bit like the, you know, the, the play love triangle, but provides a context for something that's simultaneously kind of bizarre and abstracted, perhaps comic in certain ways, I don't know, but strangely comic, not quite laughable really, and perhaps a little bit more, um, st well, strange and bizarre. So at once a playful disjunction from the everyday context and something more sinister Thanks, thanks to the combination of the clip delivery with the natural rhythms of the words straight-jacketed into even note lengths. And the staccato vocal line has something of a machine-like quality, mimicking the attack of the punctuating toy piano. And in performance, you see that. You see this attack. When you play a toy piano, you don't play it like an ordinary piano. You play it more like a typewriter, really, um, because it's striking. The, you know, it's a struck instrument. It's a percussive, percussion instrument without um, any sustain, like a, a standard piano. Um, so in some ways it's, the result is a piece that turns back on itself and becomes about again the, the attempt to put things into words I'll play you the last little section so you get an idea of how it develops as it comes back together and then I will say a few words and then stop I think so it gradually gets closer oops, wrong way <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so there's something of the reflexivity. Oh, sorry, it's, I forgot there's an extra chord at the end. Let's take the sound off. Um, something of the reflexivity that's so common in Beckett's work and that I also signalled in Barrio Sequenza 3, the attempt to tell, the attempt to tell. And Ed himself, he, he describes this as an, a tendency to develop what he calls, he says, quote, some sort of writing mechanism where the situation provides the clues, something where what is happening is also the thing being described, like a voiceover provided by an often lost or neutral performer. And part of that also involves a simultaneously honing in on the detail of a situation, but without explanatory context. Again, something that's in his work a lot, and I, again, lots of his pieces I think of as um, uh, very Beckett-like, and I think a lot of it comes from his tendency to focus upon something but we learn very little about it. So we get a location, a person, an object, or a saying. And he says, quote, I've always thought Beckett was a specialist in vagaries. Finding specifics to meditate upon within those vagaries is perhaps a preoccupation of his, perhaps of mine too. So you get a strange combination of specificity and vagueness that's in part produced by the approach to repetition or to near repetition with gradual changes and to fragmentation. There's lots of other things that I could talk about, of course, lots of other pieces. Um, but in the end, what Ed says about his work is he thinks of Beckett as um, his work as having a, a particular... He thinks of it as a tonality, is what he says. It's a kind of underlying character and sound and these things about reflexivity, these things about specificity and vagueness and, um, and processes of near repetition and patternings of things relating in sound and... Um, sound and action that never quite explain each other but, but come together to form something that's more than a sum of its parts. So he thinks of his approach as Beckett-like in that way. And I think that's probably something of what I rec recognise in that as well. I've just recently um, uh, worked with Ed on a new piece, which I hadn't, again, I hadn't thought of in the Beckett context at all until I performed it and then suddenly started to realise quite how Beckett-like it was. And again, it was to do with the ways in which particular um, forms of patterns of movement, of sound, um, of lighting, of uh, um, come together to create something that's extremely meaningful and has a specific context, but never quite elaborates further. That leaves us with, a, with work to do, to, asks us to think about um, what we're seeing and sends us back into that process of meaning making. Um, I think that's enough, isn't it? I've actually gone over time.